for all of you uh, uh, we have today a very very dear friend uh, himanshu matalia he's a uh, as i have already written his send you his resume and what all he has done in the group but he is he's fantastic corneal surgeon he has beautiful knowledge about this refractive surgery great experience he's a researcher also he is he is uh, apart from refractive surgery he does a lot of work into uh, limbal epithelial cell uh, cultures and lot many things and another good thing is he's he's a he's his way of expressing things way of uh, making people understand is amazing i remember when i was fellow he was consultant at that time aur hum हमारे पास जब भी हमें कुछ लगता था कि कोई बहुत ऐसी चीज पूछनी है जो स्टूपिड सा क्वेश्चन लग रहा है या ऐसा लग रहा है कि पीजी या वीएसएस या डांट वांट ना दे तो हम हिमांशु के पास चले जाते थे एंड 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 ही वाज सो काइंड वो हमेशा और हिमांशु वाज सो सो ऑलवेज हैज बीन सो ग्रेटफुल उसको 5 मिनट पूछो 10 मिनट पूछो 30 मिनट पूछो ही वाज ऑलवेज रेडी एंड विलिंग टू हेल्प इन बेस्ट पॉसिबल वे सो इट्स अ रियल प्रिविलेज एंड इट्स अ प्लेजर दैट हिमांशु वाज काइंड एनफ टू गिव अस टाइम and i'm sure that uh, we are going to learn a lot from this class abhi tak hamari do classes ho chuki hain dono classes thi bpl before pressing the laser button matlab laser button se pehle humne bazdan se kya kya karna hai pre operative screening humne dekha fir uh, praveen has shown beautiful uh, uh, way of how we can learn topography he has shown us so many cases so many different uh, uh, cases and how do we learn uh, topography आज इट्स नॉट बीपीएल आज इज एपीएल आफ्टर प्रेसिंग द लेजर बटन अब लेजर हो गया लेजर के बाद कभी कोई पेशेंट आता है हमारे पास और परेशान हो जाता है कि नहीं अरे सर ये क्या हो गया मेरे को तो प्लस पॉइंट फाइव फाइव मेरे को तो वहां गया था ये देखो मेरे को ए आर कार्ड दिखाता है वो माइनस जीरो पॉइंट फाइव आया पॉइंट सेवन फाइव आया ये क्या हो गया यू नो वी नो वी ऑल पीपल वी ऑल ई वेदर वी आर डूइंग रिफ्रैक्टिव सर्जरी और नॉट वी डू सी दिस काइंड ऑफ पेशेंट एंड हिमांशु इज गोइंग टू टेल अस ऑल अबाउट इट इन 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 हिज हिज यूनिक वे दैट हाउ डू वी डायग्नोज हाउ डू वी यू नो एंड डू अबाउट दैट हाउ डू वी मैनेज देम दिस इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्लास एंड आई एम श्योर that in this series this class will be of uh, great learning himanshu we have been uh, recording these classes also and we are trying to record this one also uh, so that later on we can put it on uh, youtube for uh, those people who could join so uh, thanks uh, everyone for uh, connecting and thank you so much again himanshu for giving your time so it's over to you now thank you vikas and very good morning to all of you uh i was telling vikas that it's a very simple and basic class but i'm sure you would really enjoy it because sometimes uh, basic things are something which we totally disregard and we go for things which are possibly little more advanced but we forget about basic so as they say if your ba basic or foundation is right everything will be fine so let me start with uh, a case scenario now i got, i got a call from a new lasik surgeon now, one of uh, our glaucoma friends uh, who started his private practice and of course he wanted to do lasik and started with lasik and i get a panic call that uh, i operated a low myopia of 3.5 and i'm seeing patient after one week and now patient has minus 1 in right eye and points and fine in left eye what should i do when can i take up for the touch up or enhancement i said uh, well send it across to me let me see the patient <clears throat> and what i did well i did nothing all i had to do was cycloplegic refraction and right eye was 0.25 and left eye was hemetropia i had to reassure patient and send it back to primary surgeon what we were dealing there was actually spasm of accommodation so before we go into detail of such kind of thing let me just enumerate to you one most important thing which i keep telling my fellows and my pgs and everybody that even if somebody wakes you up from the from your deep sleep uh, middle of the night you should be able to enumerate these six possible cause of refractive error after lasik surgery and these things are these i i put them in a way uh, from clockwise if we start uh, from the left side which is deliberate or non deliberate under correction everything goes goes clockwise 
especially with regards to the timing of presentation. So if you have to just remember only one slide, this is the slide to be remembered. That's deliberate. Okay, I didn't do that. Darshana, Darshana you can uh, remove this annotation, please. Okay. Okay, fine. <clears throat> so anyway, so basically, you just have to remember this slide and you're done for your LASIK surgery, right? So let's enumerate them. First cause deliberate or non deliberate under correction. Second cause spasm of accommodation. Third cause progression of myopia. Fourth, long term regression. Fifth, effect. Sixth, post LASIK ectasia. And these are the six causes of refractive error after LASIK surgery. Let's see one by one. The first cause deliberate or non deliberate under correction. Now, before we go ahead with this kind of uh, thing, let's understand what are the things which we must record when we see a follow-up case or when, he, when we see such kind of case in our OPD. The most important thing is unaided vision. It's extremely important to document unaided vision uniocularly as well as binocularly. It's very important to do a good cycloplegic refraction. And by cycloplegic refraction, I mean cycloplegic subjective acceptance and not cycloplegic retinoscopy. That's unfortunately in India, most of the time when people say I did cycloplegic refraction, that means they are referring to cycloplegic retinoscopy, which is not refraction. That's just retinoscopy. What I'm talking about is cycloplegic subjective acceptance. Okay. Then you must do a slit lamp examination, which will tell you anything which is flap related uh, issues like you have flap stri, you uh, may have DLK or anything like that will show you. Corneal topography is extremely important. Axial length uh, measurement is extremely important, which we most of the time forget. And if you have availability of entry segment OCT, that's very, very useful. We'll go back to again the, the cause which was deliberate or non-deliberate under correction. Certainly we do the investigation required. And how do we recognize them? Well, it presents immediately, immediate post-op. So if you ask patient, if it's your own patient on day one, unneeded vision would be poor. It would not be 100%. It would not be 6665. It would be certainly less than that. If it is not your own patient, you can ask the patient, how was your vision after surgery immediately? And patient might say, no, it wasn't so clear from the beginning. Well, in that case, you might be dealing with a deliberate or non-deliberate under correction. When we say deliberate or non-deliberate, we have to assume if it is not your case, that the previous surgeon has deliberately undercorrected. Do not jump over and treat the case directly because there are chances that previous surgeon did not do full correction because it would not have been safe. So do not jump over with the treatment unless you're sure about it, which you can find out from pre-op data if patient has or find out from the primary surgeon, was there a reason of undercorrection? If you want to do any touch up, you should be sure about the refraction. And for that, again, a cycloplegic refraction is must. Before touching up such kind of case, you want to check whether after surgery, is there going to be enough cornea remaining or residual bed is enough? What was the flap thickness and all such kind of things? can be detected by your anterior segment OCT. So if you have anterior segment OCT, it can certainly be of great help. The second uh, cause is spasm of accommodation. As we know earlier that the deliberate undercorrection occurs immediately. I mean, you can recognize it immediate post-op. Whereas spasm of accommodation 
takes a little longer time. It may take few days to probably a month time. Basically, the immediate post of outcome would be good. So if you see either your case or somebody else's case, if you ask the patient, how was your vision on day one? Patients say, yeah, very nice vision. Well, we know that it was certainly not a deliberate undercorrection or non-deliberate undercorrection but possibly a chance of something like spasm of accommodation. Very typically, it is associated when patient starts working, especially starts reading, computer usage, mobile phone, near work. And that's the time where they get uh, such kind of uh, spasm of accommodation. Uh, we know that when, whenever there is excessive accommodation, your refraction goes towards myopia. Hence, the near vision is good. They would tell you that my near vision is very good, but far things are not very clear. Very typically, these are anxious personality. But at the same time, when we are talking about accommodation, let me tell you one more thing which can happen, which is the other extreme of this thing, which is called lag of accommodation, where accommodation has not started. Uh, we all know that myopia, most of the myopias, they do not require significant amount of accommodation for the near work. Hence, most of these myopes have not used accommodation for most of their day-to-day -day activity. But as soon as you do LASIK for them, next moment onwards, we expect their accommodation to, should start normally. Sometimes it does not. And it takes time. And that's what we call lag of accommodation. These cases, they have decent distant vision but they may not have very good near vision. And they start complaining, I cannot read. Mind you, these are not press biopic patients. These are young people. But they take a while. Just reassure them and they'll be fine after a few days. On the other hand, if there are people where the accommodation starts acting more than what normally is required, they have spasm of accommodation. Well, this is very simple. I always give this example. Whenever you give a ball to a small child and ask the child to throw the ball, the child would not be able to throw accurately. But if I give you a ball and ask you to throw exactly to one feet uh, away from you or two feet or 10 feet, you will be able to do. And that's done because your muscles of your hand and your brain have got used to that. They have got muscle memory. They know how much to work to throw the ball two feet away from me. Same way, your accommodation, your near reflex requires some learning and which sometimes may not occur immediately. And such patient, if they do not start immediately, we call lag of accommodation. They work more than what is required they have spasm of accommodation, right? So how can you see them? Well, uh, first and foremost, reassure the patient. So reduce their screen time, de-stress them. But the most important part before all these things is a good cycloplegic refraction. It does two things. One, it actually he reduces the stress of the patient by seeing that number that you know what. After cycloplegic refraction, your eye is almost emetropic. Don't worry. This itself would de-stress the patient. Second, it breaks the cycle of uh, accommodation and it possibly can just take care of that spasm itself. But if it still persists, you may have to atropinize them. Very typically, such kind of strong spasm occurs in hyperopic LASIK. So please remember, before you do hyperopic LASIK, uh, preempt these things that these patients might have spasm of accommodation. And the pro problem with uh, us would be that at least preoperatively with hyperopic glasses, they could see clearly. Now they would not have any glass power and they, their vision will be blurred. So they need atropinization. Now, typically, atropinization is done once a day or once in the night before sleeping. You give them atropine eye drop. For a week time, you repeat this thing. And if it is fine, leave it. 
the effect may stay for another couple of weeks so totally possibly 3 weeks this time where patient might have reading uh, issues uh if it still does not happen you may have to increase the duration of atropinization <clears throat> the next cause what we get is progression of myopia now let me tell you of all six causes this is the commonest cause of post op refractive error after lasik surgery and unfortunately this is the least commonly diagnosed by us uh, why i'll i'll show you in the presentation later on so how do we diagnose progression of myopia we know that the myopia there are three common causes of myopia the commonest of them is axial myopia which which is related to change in the axial length 1 mm increase in axial length leads to three diopter of glass power the second is curvatural myopia related to change in the curvature of your cornea and third is index myopia or lenticular myopia which can be related to change in the lens like spasm of accommodation or can be the change in the refractive index of lens which can be in cataract so here we are talking about the axial myopia progression of myopia what we talk about we know it takes months together to sometime years together depending upon the natural growth of the eyeball typically the vision would be documented good on day 1 1 month 3 months but later on patient may show slow progression this is the reason why it's very important to document preoperatively axial length measurement and you must include axial length measurement in your preoperative workup the reason behind you think about the case where you have not documented the axial length and post operatively how will you claim there was a increase in axial length because you do not have anything to compare with and in all such kind of scenarios you end up actually calling these things in absence of axial length measurement all these things you will end up calling them as long term regression well the problem was we just did not document the axial length measurement pre operatively and hence we call everything myopic regression myopic regression right if we find out there was true progression in the myopia we certainly can do the touch up only after the progression is documented to be stable so do not touch these eyes unless you find out that the progression has stopped which may take little longer time so such progressive myopia just don't jump over for the retreatment or touch up now coming to the long term regression as i told you the long term regression is the commonest terminology used by refractive surgeon and unfortunately to me this is the most foolish terminology we refractive surgeon use why i'll tell you later on now how do we recognize this thing well regression is something which takes months together to sometime years together so whatever we see has actually occurred after long time so patient would have very good documented vision initially which is your day one one month three month six month but later on may show some changes well it is related to change in the anterior surface of the cornea hence whatever we see has to be seen on the corneal topography so if we look at the corneal topography which is done post operatively at one month or three months and later on if we compare it with the uh, topography and if there are some changes where whatever flattening we had achieved with lasik has reduced and cornea has become little more steep well possibly this can be one of the cause practically speaking this does not exist and i'll tell you the reason why it does not exist so to me this is highly misused terminology what do we mean by regression is basically reduced effect of ablation 
which occurs because of stromal or, or epithelial remodeling. And when we say such kind of thing, we are accepting the technology. And you are possibly giving a chance to patient to blame you, that you are taking a blame that this is the this is the basic treatment, this is how it is. Right. This can be recognized by topographic changes where your curvature or K values would be different. Your K values which are flattened down to get a myopic effect of LASIK would have shown some increase. Please do not confuse it with progression of myopia which can be detected by increase in axial length and not the K values. When I say that uh, it is not practical and it is not common. I'm referring to plenty of literature which is there, which shows the long-term outcome of Lasix in terms of change in the curvature. One such study by George Alia from Spain, 15 years follow up. And what they found in the article was that in 15 years, change in the K value was not even one diopter. Remember, on the corneal uh, curvature, one diopter change is not even one diopter on your spectacle plane. Right. So, in 15 years, there was not even one diopter change uh, which we, uh, we were expecting. And per year, if you calculate, it turns out to be 0 0.06 diopter, which is quite ridiculously small. So, if there are no changes which are occurring on the K values and on the curvature, it is not regression. Same way there are, but why did we come across such kind of thing? Well, that was because uh, Dan Ranstein published his work on change in the epithelial thickness profile, which he uh, detected on high frequency uh, ultrasound. Now, I, I certainly would say this is not wrong. And we, we in fact, we did, I, I, I published this thing as, as well as my site. And I, in fact, I, uh, I had a best paper last year in ESRS for, uh, uh, for the epithelial profile change which occurred uh, uh, because of uh, post-refractive surgery. What we are talking about here is from day one up to day up to three month follow up, there can be change in the epithelial thickness profile, which can change in the myopia a little bit. I'm not disputing that there is no change occurring. There is certainly change in the epithelial profile, but it reflects to such a minuscule amount of refractive error that I wouldn't bother about it so much. Also, even if you look at Dan Ranstein's study here, you see there is a change from one month to three months, but three months onward, it becomes static. It remains same. So at long term, when we say, well, we are not actually talking about even the epithelial remodeling because it has already occurred. Also, we refer to such kind of thing in terms of refractive error. We always say high myopia has more chance of regression. Low myopia has less chance of regression. One more such study, where nine years follow up and they, they compared low, moderate to high myopia and look at the difference. It's not even 0.5 diopter and there's no change irrespective of their high, low or moderate myopia. So, well, it's not true that high myopia can have more regression. We also talk about, oh, regression is more common with PRK. Interestingly, the same study also studied PRK versus LASIK, and you know what? Nothing, no difference between PRK and LASIK also. So what happens here is because we have not measured the axial length, whatever refractive error we get, we like to take that blame, like a true leader that whatever goes wrong, it's my mistake. And I say sorry for that. We all ophthalmologists love to do that. We, we love to find out the mistakes which are our mistakes, irrespective whether it was our mistake or not. The problem was a simple thing of axial length measurement 
we did not document preoperative had we document that we could have compared with this thing and blamed it on the patient's eye which was the true uh, cause which was a progression of myopia and not regression but in absence of that well we still have to say sorry that's my mistake coming to the fifth cause which is cataract and i certainly don't need to teach you how to diagnose cataract but we also know that cataract takes long time so presentation is much later there is good documented vision on day 1 1 month 6 month until the cataract develops and later on you might start seeing myopic shift but as we know the myopic shift here is related to change in the refractive index of the lens so your topography would be normal your axial length would be same as your uh, pre op and hence whatever changes we are seeing are from the lens a cycloplegic refraction would not change anything and we know the quality of vision also would be poor patient would complain lot of aberration when patient complains you can actually detect them if you have a abrometers like i design you can see more internal aberration or something like dysfunctional lens index you can detect or if you have pentacam you can see the increased densitometric changes on your uh, pentacam sometimes clinically you may not be able to diagnose the uh, the cataract but same case when you do an abrometry you see the case now just to uh, give you an idea about how do i read uh, this map the top part is simulated uh, e chart when you are seeing through this thing the top left here is the related abrometry related to the corneal surface this will be related to your lasik which is pretty decent the middle part is internal anything which is beyond the anterior surface of the cornea and commonly here we are talking about the lenticular part the bottom middle part is basically the opacity map and which is increase in case of cataract the middle part the bar which is showing the arrow which is 0.93 which is the dysfunctional lens index lower the index more is the chances of your aberration and final uh, uh, top right part is the addition of everything together the total aberration can we remove these uh, uh annotation yes sir. i'm doing it fine not a problem that's okay sir. take a while sir i'm doing it okay fine thank you so the final cause of the sixth cause of refractive error after the uh, cataract after lasik surgery is post lasik ectasia all of us those who do lasik we are really scared of this person or post lasik ectasia fortunately for us the incidence of this thing is very low there are millions of lasik done across the world and reported case of ectasia are not very high whatever you use whatever criteria you use whether you know, you use whatever you know, diagnostic devices or whatever uh, your uh, pre op protocols nothing is 100% sure to predict ectasia so irrespective whatever you do with your best practice also if you have done enough number of lasik you ought to come across one of your case which will have post lasik ectasia so don't be worried about it but it does not mean that we should not avoid it try to avoid as much as possible as much as you can do to do uh, prevent that but if it occurs please remember that everybody has blood in their hand so how do we recognize that well it's a very gradual process it takes many months to years together to manifest 
all these patients they would have very good vision immediate post operatively on day 1 1 month 6 month till they present with such kind of thing remember the ectasia never occurs as a uniform ectasia in the center part of the cornea it usually occurs inferior paracentral region and the superior part still remains intact and flat so whenever such kind of irregularity is there on the shape uh, as i would show on an associate picture here as you can see the change in the shape which you uh, you can recognize that it's more inferior paracentral and not the center part uh, the refractive error what we get is not just a spherical error you end up getting compound myopic astigmatism also you end up getting higher order aberrations like your you know, coma trifoil and all those things which will reduce the quality of vision hence the best corrected vision what you see is never 6 by 6 or never 6 by 5 it can usually be less than that it reduces the quality of vision and how we pick up this thing or how do we diagnose well it's picked up on the posterior surface of the cornea where you can pick up the earlier changes when it manifests in the in the revision or in refraction well it's seen seen on the anterior surface also and you can recognize it on your placidos based topographer also so when you recognize in ectasia on the anterior surface it's always late but early recognizing can be there on the posterior surface so this is a pentacam print out of uh, one of the ectasia case uh, which i was handling as you can see the top left one which is the sagittal curvature map but let me tell you one thing i though i use sagittal curvature map in most of the time of topography but if you want to see the centration of your uh, refractive treatment you must use tangential map which gives you an accurate centration right so post lasik please use tangential map more than the sagittal map but anyway what you can see from here that the top part is blue uh 34 and so still very flat cornea but the lower part is red with 57 and such steep cornea 57 58 and all those kind of hands the ectasia is more limited to inferior part the the bottom right part what you see is the posterior elevation map where my arrow is there and that shows where the elevation is seen and which is again little inferior paracentral remember lasik or prk whatever we do we are only changing the anterior surface of the cornea and not the posterior surface of the cornea so whether you have pre op data or not whenever post operatively you do a pentacam and when you start seeing any increase posterior elevation than the normal remember you might be dealing with post lasik ectasia now how do we treat it well remember post lasik ectasia is not keratoconus they are very different entity altogether so post lasik ectasia you do not wait and watch you already lost your time so if you have to treat post lasik ectasia with cross linking it was yesterday so if today you are getting a case you have to treat this thing as early as possible now when you do a cross linking we know that the cross linking only stops the progression but these patients do require visual rehabilitation so how do we visually rehabilitate them well you can give them glasses you can give them contact lens you can use treatment like intracornea corneal rings you can uh, do a topo guided surface ablation many of these things or in worst case you can do a corneal transplant also but remember one thing these patient had high axial length or rather have high axial length 
their refractive error was treated by not reducing the axial length just by flattening the cornea or rather the anterior surface of the cornea moment you change the anterior surface it's going to reflect in the vision of this patient so you think about it if you give them a contact lens and negate the lasik treatment or ablation treatment what you had done your myopia will get exposed so if you give a zero power rgp lens to this patient and if patient had minus 10 pre op refractive error patient will now with zero power rgp lens will have minus 10 right so giving contact lens uh, would require them to treat for their primary refractive error also you think about it if you do a corneal transplant for these patient now these patient had reduced uh, uh, their vision only after ectasia before that they enjoyed good vision because cornea was flat and now you replace that partly flat cornea from superior part with the normal curvature cornea the axial myopia will manifest so after dal core after pkp you will have refractive error of whatever pre op patient had like minus 9 minus 10 and patient would still require glasses contact lens whatever so think about if you can actually just reduce the ectasia only without affecting the flat part of superiorly well that happens with intracorneal ring or intax uh with the current contact lenses like mini scleral scleral lenses my numbers of intax have come down drastically earlier i used to do lot of intax but now my numbers have come down drastically but if i still have to choose only one indication where i would still do intax that would be post lasik ectasia and here i would use only one ring in the area of ectasia which will try to flatten my ectasia ectatic area as much without affecting my superior flat area So as you can see from the corneal topography here, first is the pre-op picture, shows significant uh, ectasia in inferior part, and second is post-op picture uh, after possibly six months, and which shows pretty regular surface uh, in terms of uh, whatever we are uh, seeing uh, in uh, these patients. So uh, if you have to treat uh, one of the best treatment option of post lasik ectasia would be single ring intax with collagen cross linking so this completes uh, my talk on post lasik refractive error to again enumerate uh, all six causes deliberate or non deliberate under correction how do we recognize immediate post op you will see them uh, if it's safe to undergo uh, touch up you can do it spasm of accommodation how do we recognize well usually at one week one month time uh, do a cycloplegic uh, refraction and treat that if it doesn't get treated like that well you can possibly do a uh, atropionization third cause progression of myopia takes many uh, months two years depending upon the change in the axial length always measure pre op uh, axial length uh, so that you can confirm this diagnosis uh, fourth case is long term regression which is related to change in the topography or change in the k values which usually is not very common but you can always uh, do it uh, if you compare post op topography with post op topography long term post op topography fifth is cataract we know that we can clinically diagnose cataract but your abrometries can certainly help you all such cases would have a normal topography and would have a normal axial length last but not least is post lasik ectasia where your uh, posterior elevation would show changes in early cases in advanced cases you would see it on the refraction as well as on the placidose based topographer also 
treatment would require cross-linking and intracorneal rings. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Himanshu. That was a fantastic talk, and I think there was a lot of lots of learnings. And I think there were two learnings. If if everybody can take away is one is ensure that we do an axial length all pre-op, and second is post-operative pentacam or topography. Because you know uh, many times what happens is once the patient is fine, we generally don't uh, do a pentacam or uh, topography that we do. Uh, Himanshu, one question is. Yeah, to well, me, I would just say one thing. At three months, a, a topography post-operatively will save your skin most of the time and will also exactly. help you about whether the treatment was centered properly or not. And also it will show that in future that you, it was not your problem. You had documented a good piece in topography and can help you in your timeline also. Yeah, please. Yes. Yes, yes, and and uh, to all, we had heard uh, Praveen day before yesterday. He highlighted that when we are seeing a topo map uh, after LASIK, it is a change which is important. So even if you see uh, some in in if, if you see posterior floor, there are some abnormality. But if you see the change over a period of time, that becomes very 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 crucial. The same thing which Himanshu has highlighted that we need to ensure that we do a topography three months or at least one month. Uh, after the LASIK. Uh, Himanshu, my question is, so, so suppose you see post-operatively uh, spherical or cylindrical refractory error. And then if cylindrical refractory error, that cylinder is different or maybe 90 degrees or some degrees away from the pre-operative cylinder. Do you have, does this tell you something that see if you have post-operatively, you have only a spherical number or if there's a cylindrical number and which is increasing of this cylindrical number, which accesses different from the previous or pre-operative one. Himanshu. So because a few things, uh, 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 just to add up on the previous comment which you made, even if you do not have your pre-op data, post-LASIK, when you see any changes on the posterior elevation, which is not normal, there are two possibilities. Either somebody has already fried this cornea where there was a form of cystic keratoconus or you are dealing with an early ectasia. So even irrespective whether you have pre-op or not, even irrespective whether you have comparison, on PRK or LASIK cases, posterior surface should not show elevation. Right. Okay. Coming okay. Back just a minute, just a minute. Because, because there will be people who will having this question in mind. Because when uh, Praveen was talking about uh, topography in the day before yesterday, he made a comment that when we are seeing post-refractive surgery, uh, the posterior float specifically, these, these the, the normative data that we have, that is not designed for, these are designed for the virgin corneas and not the ones which has have the ablations. So uh, if we want to see a posterior float, so do we apply the same uh, uh, indices same so, so value or do you want to, yeah, yeah. do you want to make a comment on that i, I think I, I'll, I'll just rephrase your question now there are two things which you are discussing one is measurement of your posterior elevation which does not require any normative data and second is coming to indices which requires normative data where you compare with that right so what praveen would have said would be indices that when you see changes in your uh, bad D value or anything like that, so indices, but how we measure the posterior elevation does not actually require any normative database. What computer does in an elevation-based topographer, it actually demark demarks the posterior surface of the cornea by just uh, doing edge demarcation using the edge detection protocol. And then based on which, uh, the, again, based on the computer calculation or which best fit sphere fits in the maximum amount of the central six millimeter zone where the contact is maximum and that would be your best fitting sphere. How much is above that? How much is below that? So you do not need any normative data to check actually posterior elevation. But if you're talking about indices, yes, indices are always with normative data. Right? So what I'm talking is the picture of your posterior elevation. When you see a posterior elevation on your 
uh, elevation based topographer if it is elevated it is abnormal unless you are dealing with so i didn't want to unnecessarily complicate this thing however there are cases where if you are dealing with a smaller diameter cornea you can have falsely increased elevation of posterior surface right so if you see posterior elevation you always measure horizontal y to y diameter and if it is smaller well you can expect that to falsely show up as a posterior elevation but forget about that part for the practical purpose post lasik anything which you see abnormal on posterior surface in the map it is abnormal beautiful i think you have nicely categorized so that this question doesn't come in the mind thanks you can go ahead with the, uh, the second part of the question the refraction uh, ref spherical okay. versus cylindrical so the, 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 okay so when we get a change in the refractive uh, error post operatively uh, we 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 have enumerated there are six possible causes still your refractive error has to fit in one of these six causes right now let's assume that it was our own case and it wasn't deliberate under correction so that is gone now only five things remaining whenever we see post operatively any case with refractive error we must do cycloplegic refraction so if there is a spasm of accommodation which can actually show a very different axis also then what you see on your topography uh, we can detect that that also goes out third is progression of myopia usually progression of myopia leads to more of the change in your spherical power but still it can lead to change in the cylindrical power also but how do we uh, detect that well you would be able to detect this thing by looking at the change in your axial length however the change in axial length talks more about the spherical power when we have change in the cylindrical power which is unusual change in the cylindrical power and especially along with that if the best corrected vision of the patient is not uh, normal as in it is not uh, let me uh, go back to okay so if the best corrected vision of the patient is not 6 by 6 that means you are dealing with something which has higher order abrasion any higher order abrasion will have component of sphere and cylinder so if you are dealing with say early ectasia decentered treatment smaller optical zone it would lead to comma it would lead to spherical abrasion all such kind of thing will have some component of sphere and cylinder and such cases would have a cylinder which is relatively abnormal but all such kind of cases will have the vision or best corrected vision which is not optimal which will be less than 6 by 6 or 6 by 5 so when you have cylindrical power which was not same as pre op which again is not related to this thing it doesn't matter whether we have pre op cylindrical power which was whatever direction but uh, it's still something which is uh, 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 which is okay, let me just go back to okay, fine yeah so if it's still uh, uh, different than what you get you are still dealing with one of these things only right? also remember when such things are little more common when we suddenly have started doing lot more topo guided treatments and contour treatment purely because the treatment what you do is not just lower order aberration sphere and cylinder the treatment you do is actually including a significant amount of irregular treatment which treats as well as induces higher order aberration so many such contour uh, treatment when they come back they do come back with refractive error which is quite abnormal which is a cylindrical power which is very different axis and which is uh, something which is possibly not giving absolute good vision 
Thank you, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, Dashna, you can go ahead with the questions. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Himanshu, sir. Thank you so much. It was an excellent class. Yeah, now absolutely, all absolutely. of us can. Now all of us can organize the causes of post lasic refractive error in our minds and can manage accordingly. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can take yes. up the questions next. Uh, first question sure. is from. Should I stop sharing the slides so that we can have a little better bandwidth? Yes, that's yes, fine. Sir. That's fine. Yes, sir. You can. You can. We can see you now. You can in, uh, put on your video. Okay. The so first question is from Dr. Karan. He wants to know what is the age uh, till which the progression of axial length has been noted up till now. Dr. Karan, please, you are already unmuted. Okay, so uh, Karan, yeah, that's a morning. question. I don't think anybody has idea. So what happens is, is all such kind of data when we talk about, you no, know, it's a very vague generalization where we 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 do everything generalized. We say average age of uh, somebody progression is this. Average age of myopia progression is 18 to 20. And average life life expectancy in India is 65. Does it mean on 65th birthday, you should say Tata bye bye to everybody in sleep? Certainly not. Because somebody may live for 90 years normally and somebody may die at 50 years, which can be a normal death. How all such kind of data are arrived is you take a sample, you take a mean of that, two standard deviation on both the sides, and then you say this is the average age of progression. Also along with this thing, we do take extremes and just to be statistically true, we remove the extremes so that uh, we are getting probably better data. But it only is possible to detect an individual rather than thinking about how many are reported because I don't think anybody have reported progression of myopia in crores of patients we are who are living uh, on earth so uh, i'm sure there would be so many people where they may show so one patient i'll, I'll share you an anecdote one of my colleague dr sushma uh, she had a patient she referred to me uh, two years back a patient uh, had a refractive error of 0 0.5 here okay. in two years today he has a refractive error of almost minus seven. Okay. Her, there is no ectasia on her cornea. Her axial length is just increasing. We measured her corneal biomechanics and whatever and still turns out to be the same. But it's certainly a case report. But now if I look at this thing, can I have a which can have the diameter of progression after 30 years, 40 years, why not? It can be. I can only detect if I have a pre op measurement and post op measurement. Okay. Yeah, Imanshu, I think, okay. Imanshu, I think okay. what he wanted to say is that uh, on generally, like what you shared is, is a rare thing, right? We don't see that uh, quite commonly. Yeah, so, sorry? Uh, yeah, Imanshu, I think what I was discussing is what I think. Uh, Karan wanted to know is the average in general. So what you shared right now is... Darshna, Darshna, can you mute everyone? Yes, sir, I'm muting. Yes, please mute. Um, mute Karan also. Okay, I'm, I'm now I'm unmute. Okay, so average... Frankly speaking, current average does not work out here. Uh, you may be happy if I give you an average, which will be totally ballpark figure, 18 to 21 year of age. How does it make any difference? All it make difference is in my individual case, if I'm able to document stop in progression of axial length, well, I'm fine. And in my particular case, after LASIK also, I'm seeing increase in the axial length. I know I'm dealing with the progression of myopia cases. Great. So I think Karan is pretty clear that it depends upon your case. And I, what, what comes out is axial length. 
measurement is very important. Dashna, you can go to the second question, please. Yes, sir. We have next question from Dr. Debu Priya. She wants to know uh, how uh, how do you deal with decentered ablation, sir? Okay, so uh, uh, that's a totally uh, different uh, question altogether. But let me tell you one thing: decentered ablation. As I was discussing earlier, I, I actually spoke a little bit about decentered ablation also. Now, when you have decentered ablation, what happens is that you end up uh, having an optical zone which is not exactly in the center visual axis of your you know, cornea. It is a little bit away. So, in such cases, your refractive error in entire visual axis is not uniform. You may not be able to uniformly or accurately measure the refractive error also here because it would have led to higher order abrasions like comma, trifoil, spherical abrasion. So, the bottom line is your reliability of subjective acceptance is not very high. Just remember, just keep in your mind one part. The second part, well, when you see that uh, the ablation is not centered, you might have to treat it with the irregularity, whatever it is there on the cornea, by negating that irregularity, which can be done by a topo-guided treatment. Now, when you do a topo-guided retreatment on such cornea, you will have two choices. One choice, you can do, go ahead and do a treatment where you can treat the irregularity of the cornea along with the subjective refractive error, what you have got now, and treat that as well as the irregularity. But we discuss now that the reliability of your refractive error would not be very high. So I would say do not try to combine complete refractive error treatment along with treating a decentered ablation. I would possibly treat as low and sometimes even zero refractive error and just do a treatment of topo guided treatment on the surface. And you would be surprised many times, this itself would take care of the refractive error. Later on, if required, I can do one more treatment where I can do, if required, I can do a wavefront optimized or even wavefront guided treatment and not topo guided as touching up of your refractive error. But please do not try to treat both complete refractive error along with a decentered ablation. Dashna, you there? Yes, sir, I'm there. Uh, please take up unmuted. the next. Hope you yes. are clear. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, we have next question from uh, Dr. Harinder Longya, sir. He wants to know uh, how do you manage the residual post op cylinder if it if at all it is there? Is it a machine error? So uh, um, again, uh, Dr. Longya, the causes are only six. There is no seventh cause. I mean, there can be, if you want to extend your imagination, say flat first uh, can lead to cylindrical power, but otherwise there are six causes. Now, if you just want to rule out that, as I told you, post-operatively, you see the slit lamp. And if you see there are flat stria, which can lead to Maddox rod kind of effect and which can possibly give you a cylindrical uh, reflective error also. But if you do not have that, Again, it boils down to same thing. There are only six causes which we are dealing with, right? Irrespective whether you are dealing with cylinders, sphere, it does not matter. Now, when you are doing a, uh, so the first cause when I said was deliberate or non-deliberate undercorrection, right? In non-deliberate part also comes your machine error, as in your assistant has not had not entered the refraction properly or your optometrist had measured the refraction wrong eye or whatever you do, that was a non-deliberate undercorrection which you're talking about. The deliberate part or even the machine error. So the deliberate part is something which you plan to treat but non-deliberate part is all your machine error, your human error, your anything which you you not lifted the flap properly all these are 
non deliberate part so there is there is no seventh cause there is only six cause and you still treat it same way cycloplegic refraction wait for the stable refraction so whenever you do any retreatment remember one dictum you must wait for two stable topography and two stable refraction which is done six weeks apart and whichever is late so if topography is stabilized but refraction is not stabilized still wait and when it is stable both of them are stable then you can think of doing anything whatever you want to right so uh, we do not jump over with any retouch up treatment very early also generally garmiyon mein badal de mausam hi hoti hai thank you thank you sir thank you sir we have next question from dr kanav he wants to know what is the use of tangential map matlab ye 2 minute ho gaye ek call pe tha main wo mera number uh so kind of uh, tangential map uh, so remember one thing in topography whatever you see whether it's an axial map tangential map this is still not a true shape of the cornea this is just a way of depicting shape of the cornea like if i tell you what is the shape of moon well you can say a gola or sphere but if you go there on moon there are valleys there are mountains there are there are so many things i mean that's not the shape of that surface but the shape which closely related to the moon we assume that let's call it a globular surface or circular thing so all these things topographic pictures what you see is not true shape of the cornea it's just a depiction in one particular way the way you what to depend upon way the computer is calculating that commonest way of depicting a topography is axial map and why it is common because it gives you pattern diagnosis every disease may have specific pattern and which actually map proves that whereas tangential map shows a sort of an irregularity in localized area so each cornea can actually be different on a tangential map so a tangential map may not give you a pattern diagnosis so it does not mean that every time a lot of time uh, we cornea guys talk that tangential map is the best map you must use tangential map that's not true i don't think tangential map has its own limitation but having said that when we are talking about refractive surgery if you want to see the true ablation zone and anything you only tangential map because the axial map pins down the map from center of the map to the periphery so it forms sort of a multiple radii or radii of curvature in different different area so every map of axial uh, topography comes towards the center <coughs> so sometimes what happens is smaller change which are usually seen on the cornea which are not true changes may show up on an axial topography after lasik as a sort of a central island or especially the inferior part which is coming in the visual axis but if you use a tangential map post lasik you might see that the the ablation is very nice and central so tangential map post refractive uh, surgery certainly the best map to use okay sir thank you thank you so much thank you sir we have next question from dr khushboo she wants to know how do you calculate the uh, size of the intact ring and where do you place it exactly <laughs> that's a that's a course itself uh, i i don't think i mean it would be possible for me to explain the uh, uh, orally like that we, we surely can plan uh, so you if you have such yeah we can do it later yeah we you have such nice beautiful group we can have one class on intex so we we, we yeah. can uh, do that but kush would just to uh, give you an idea uh, by default your post lasik ectasia is something where you want to treat uh, the area of ectasia so wherever you see the decentration or the ectasia you want to put push that ectasia towards the center 
So you just need one ring which pushes your ectasia towards the center. So if ectasia is in this side, you want to push from this side. So you want one ring here, right? So it's a single ring. Usually, if your reflective error is within Q diopter of a, a cylinder and single digit cylinders, your 4.5 to uh, 400, I mean, 4. And 400 micron to 450 micron ring is good enough. Uh, but well, we'll, we'll surely talk about uh, Intex later on. The depth usually is uh, something as 75% to 70% depth, depending upon what technique you are using uh, and inferior ring water. So in nutshell, post lasik ectasia, single inferior ring of 0 0.45 uh, at uh, 350 micron depth. Yeah, and Khushbu, in the meantime, in case you have a patient, you can plan it. The company people who supply the ring, they also help a lot. So you can take whatever map they are giving and then send it to Himanshu, take an opinion and go ahead. Uh, by the time we have uh, our class on end up. Sure. I think that, that, that uh, clears it, Khushbu. We can go to the second question. Next question. Thank Krishna. you, sir. Next question is uh, from Dr. Hafsa. Uh, ma'am, I have already unmuted you. You can go ahead with your question, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, hi, good morning. I just wanted to ask a question. I have a patient uh, in whom I don't have a pre-op axial length and he's 18 years old. And now by de default, he has a refractive error in one of the eye of minus 0.50. So what would be your take on, because he needs to be uh, given an uh, examination for his army selection and he wants a retouch up. So what would be your take on in such a case? So uh, Hafsa, this is a little delicate situation. Sometimes in ophthalmology, we don't treat a patient based on science only. We put some emotion also along with uh, that, not ophthalmology, any, any medical uh, field. And the emotion part comes here in most of these exams and most of these this is a entrance, they claim this is my only lifetime opportunity and uh, please uh, help me. And you get sucked into this thing and you do the treatment which you would not have done uh, otherwise. So I really don't think I need to tell you, but I'm sure you know that none of us can actually predict how long it will take for that stabilization of refractive error to occur. Most of the time, they are looking at a window period of probably few months. By then, they would have finished their exam and finished their interviews. And after that, they care damn about whether they get refractive error or not. Uh, have I done such kind of thing? I have to confess, yes, not for army, but uh, they, they usually used to come here for uh, merchant navy. And they say it's such a branch where I've uh, done so much from my lifetime and my life will be changed. And you get into that and you do the treatment. And you know, after probably a few years, there may be a progression of myopia and still could have the reflective error. So in such patient, if at all, I don't think I would say go ahead or not go ahead. You can take your call, but at least make sure that you're not dealing with an ectasia. Make sure that you are you are having a good posterior elevation and based on what your conscious says, uh, go ahead. I don't think there's anything right and wrong here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We have next question from Dr. Jignesh. He wants to know oh, what is the difference exactly between elevation maps and tangential maps, especially in post-op cases. So they, they, they're basically two different way of topography. I, I, I think uh, uh, Jignesh, uh, I can discuss with you. Jignesh is a very dear friend. Uh, so I can uh, discuss with you uh, later on also because they had a topography class last time. But uh, Jignesh, this is a, a different way of uh, uh, depicting a topography. Whereas elevation-based topographers, they try to fit a known best shape surface and how from that best fitting surface you are you you show it as a map there is a, a curvature topography measures the radius of curvature at different point like in tangential it would measure the different point and different zone also uh, so it's basic basically measurement of radius of curvature versus the elevation so in 
curvature topography, you talk about steep and uh, non-steep or steep and flat. Whereas in elevation-based topography, you talk about above the best fitting sphere, below the best fitting sphere. So it's, in, it's usually in micron about the best fit sphere, micron below the best fit sphere. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have next question from Dr. Nidhi. Dr. Nidhi, you are unmuted. You can go ahead with your question. Hello. Yes, Dr. Nidhi, you are audible to us. Okay, good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, I have done LASIK for a patient around five months back in October. And uh, as the patient was referred to me by some ophthalmologist only, so patient was following up with the, that doctor only. And according to them, patient was doing very fine. But the patient came back to me in January uh, with decreased vision. Patient age was around 23 years. And uh, to my surprise, patient was having refractive error of somewhere around 1.5 SNR diopter spherical in both the eyes. I don't remember exactly. So I just wanted to know how to proceed for that in such cases as the patient was in little hurry because she, her marriage was planned in somewhere in February. So I repeated the topography for that patient. Topography was quite stable. So should I go for reinforcement or for touch-up or we should wait? Again, uh, maybe uh, the answer remains the same. I, I'm sure after this talk, you know the answer that there are six possible causes. Yeah, of, true, true. Certainly the vision was good earlier. So it wasn't deliberate or non-deliberate under correction. Right, sir. Uh, it was related to, hopefully you would have done the cycloplegic refraction. So wasn't related to spasm of accommodation. Third, uh, progression of myopia. Well, if we had the pre-op excellent measurement, we could have told, confirmed, I mean, we could have told with uh, full conviction that yes, this is related to uh, the progression, but we may not have. So we, we have to keep quiet there. Uh, mm -hmm. Fourth, the uh, change in the curvature or regression. Well, if the corneal curvature has not changed on topography is not changed much, that's not very important. Practically, it's not common. If you know that if there is no cataract in that young person, you're certainly not worried about that. And sixth is post lasik ectasia. If your topography does not show any posterior elevation, ultimately, it boils down to only one reason, that is progression of myopia. Now, what you want to treat it, that will be a copy-paste of previous uh, thing, what Dr. Hafsa said. Now, if this lady does not want to join army, wants to probably lead an army by, by marrying somebody. So, it again boils down to the same thing. Do you want to oblige her by doing a retreatment? Remember one thing, every retreatment has its own problem also. Right? So, Patients right. must understand all the nuances of retreatment. Please tell them that if I'm lifting a flap, there are chances that there can be epithelial ingrowth. There are chances there can be flap stria. There are chances that my, I might have other flap related complication, DLK and so on and so forth. If you are doing a surface treatment, there can be chance of scarring and all those things. So explain patient properly. They should not take it lightly. And if they understand everything, I leave it to you. If you want to oblige her to look good and uh, that's fine then. So Nidhi, if you, explain all, if, if you explain all these things, you know what is the patient going to tell you. <laughs> right, sir. So can we share the topography of that patient on this uh, uh, platform? I have yes, the yes. earlier topography you can, also. You can, you can share it later, uh, Nidhi, not right now. Okay, sir. And second thing I wanted was how early we can go for the touch-up? So as I told you that uh, it depends on stable to stable reflection. So again, it boils down to the same thing. Only six causes. Okay. If your six right, cause, in six cause, if your cause is number three, progression of myopia, then it depends on you how stable the um, progression has occurred. Right, sir. If it is not stable, well, you have to wait. If it is okay, done. something like, say, non deliberate under correction, 
Well, in that mm-hmm. case, I would wait for two stable topography, two stable refraction, which is done at least six weeks apart, and then only think about any touch-up. Right, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. We are done with most of the questions, sir. I have one last question for you, yes, sir. How, sir, how do you counsel the patients with post lasic regression? Mute, mute, everyone. Because I don't believe post lasic regression occurs. So for me, it's progression of myopia. So I always measure the excellence, and I always show the patient that see. Now, if I have a patient who has the refractive error of 0.75, right? Now, 0.75 diopter means, like three diopter means one millimeter change. 1.5 diopter means 0.5 millimeter change. 0.75 diopter means 0.25 millimeter change in excellent. Well, I always do optical biometry in all my pre-op LASIK patient and post-op. So in my IOL master, if I see there is a change in excellent, I show them, see, there is change in your excellent. And it is something which we have to wait and watch till it becomes stable. If you want, we can do the retouch up when it stabilizes. Otherwise, it has its own issues. If you want, I'm fine. Thank you, sir. Uh, great. Great. I think I think this this is a very this was a very very good class and as Himanshu has rightly pointed out there's no need to take a blame of everything that whatever has happened has happened because of you know the surgeon there are there are reasons and we can always explain it to the patient. Uh, this was a very good class Himanshu I'm I'm so thankful to you I'm sure most of us all of us we we are going to change something or add something in a routine workup whether it is a pre op workup or how we see the patients later on and uh, it was a fantastic class thank you so much for giving your time and expertise and thank you everyone for joining here and uh, uh, keeping this uh, passion of learning so that we can you know uh, keep on doing these kind, kind of classes for all of us here thank you so much everyone questions he has mentioned uh, does he want to ask Somebody want uh, to ask? Yes, yes, sir. I'm just unmuting him. Yeah, please go ahead. Dr. Gaurav, you are unmuted. You can go ahead with your question, sir. Sir, you need to unmute yourself from your side as well. Dr. Gaurav, please. Oh. Hello, hello. Yeah, yes, Gaurav, go ahead. Go ahead. So it was very great class, sir. I just have a question. You mentioned of cycloplegic subjective acceptance. You give yes. importance to that. So how do you, you it, that might be different from the uh, uh, ex- uh, we, uh, subjective acceptance which we do without cycloplegia. So how you use that information? Yes, sir. Uh, so first and foremost, it's only India we call cycloplegic refraction as retinoscopy. Nowhere in the world. When you, when you talk to anybody in the world, when you say, I have done cycloplegic refraction, they assume you are talking about cycloplegic subjective acceptance and not retinoscopy. Okay, so somehow we all are trained in our medical colleges in a way that cycloplegic refraction means cycloplegic retinoscopy, which is not true. Okay, now coming back to the subject acceptance cycloplegic, you would be really surprised most of the time all such cycloplegic acceptance are very accurate. In fact, all my pre-op cases of uh, LASIK, I do dilated acceptance also, right? Non-cycloplegic, dilated acceptance. And believe me, it's as good as your undilated acceptance, except it might be probably 0.25 less than undilated acceptance. And if there is any significant change, my, my optometrist, would repeat it on the day of surgery as PMT. But cycloplegic subjective acceptance is very accurate. It may be 0.25 less than that, but it will, because whatever you had, you have actually treated the entire refractive error. So whatever your remaining refractive error is something which would be pretty accurately detected there. So uh, I'm not saying you're gonna give glass prescription there, 
but your myopia which your your patient was showing which was related to spasm of accommodation would certainly be detected and would certainly show up as reduction in number and as i opened with that uh, uh, thing which uh, uh, one of um, our colleague uh, glaucoma colleague who had sent a patient to me undilated uh, uh, subject acceptance of minus 1 in right eye and 0.75 in left eye cycloplegic refraction minus 0.25 in right eye and zero in left eye and such patient when you do a pmt and later on patient uh, becomes all right would be hemotropic so just now there's a comment it said that there should be a class on refraction also so oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we we will arrange that don't worry for sure uh, but but it was a fantastic one and uh, we had close to 80 participants in this group himanshu and i am sure that everybody got benefited from this and thank you so much for giving your time thanks so much